King Aegon Targaryen, second of his name, pictured here at his coronation, soaking in the adoration, affection, and acceptance of his people, will be one of the key figures to shape the plot of season two of House of the Dragon. Ah, yeah. We're back, baby. Will political power be able to fill the yawning chasm inside of young Aegon that drinking, womanizing, and flea-bottom derelicting could not? Perhaps a bit of violent warfare. Perhaps his parents should have shown him unconditional love. Maybe a little bit of discipline. Oh well. He's king now. What could go wrong? I'm, I'm sure he'll step up to the challenge. Oh, he looks bored. That's not good. That's the thing about confining dragon lords to small council meetings, though. Sometimes they suffer from, call it a lack of stimulation. And although we didn't really get to see Aegon's dragon, his magnificent golden beast, Sunfire, in season one, the most beautiful dragon to ever grace the skies of Westeros, mind you, that will be remedied in season two, I promise. There's War Afoot, in case you forgot where we left off last season, and every dragon rider will be called upon to test his might or her might, including King Aegon II Targaryen. Today's video will be our No Spoilers Season 2 Aegon preview, and do make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss any of our other character previews or House of the Dragon coverage throughout the season. Today we'll talk about Aegon as both king and dragon rider, we'll talk about his dragon Sunfire, and we'll discuss the most important relationships in Aegon's life. Otto and Alicent, obviously, but also Aemond and Helena. Hey there friends, David Lightbringer here. House of the Dragon Season 2 is here. House of Flying D's now in session. And yeah, Aegon is not just a king, he's also a dragon lord, and that's a very important thing to consider. That's actually one of the most interesting dynamics about dragon warfare in this world of Westeros and Ice and Fire. These aren't the type of war leaders who can lead their armies from the safety of a command tent, or a distant throne room. Instead, it's kind of like a World War II type battle where the generals are also the only trained fighter pilots. Yeah, that's interesting. And because the dragons have such a disproportionate effect on a battle, really both sides have no choice but to engage their dragon lords, even if they are kings, princes, princesses, or 13 years old. And that is the other factor that makes this more interesting, the fact that many of our dragon lords are teenagers or recent teenagers with little to no actual experience in warfare and all the emotional issues of a teenager. Thank God I'm an adult now. I don't have any emotional issues anymore. That was rough all that time ago in the past. Anyway, we saw that dynamic come into play with the unfortunate chomp of young Lucerys and Arax. Sorry. The chomp, as it shall be known, uh, where Aemon's aggression and poor judgment combined with both dragon riders' lack of control, total control over their dragons, and now we have the Dance of Dragons Civil War pushed past the point of no return. King Aegon is like 20 or 21, and he's in command, like I said, of a fearsome dragon, one of the larger dragons named Sunfire. He also commands a kingdom, or half, half of one, and, and many armies. So again, what kinds of things will bubble to the surface when power and pressure give Aegon a little squeeze? After all, being groomed to sit a throne, I assume, is an insane amount of pressure to be brought up with as a child. And on top of that, this whole thing is compounded by the fact that your mom and grandfather kind of sort of did a coup and started a war that passed you the baton. So... There's that. It's actually an insane position to shove anyone into, let alone someone as inexperienced as young Aegon. How will he handle the pressure cooker? That is the question. And there have been some fairly troubling signs, it must be said. From his abuse of the serving women in the Red Keep, to his vices, to his seeming inability just to take things seriously. And even more concerning, in my opinion, is, again, this black hole of acceptance that is now being filled by the heady, euphoric mix of supreme executive power and adulation. And soon, the ultra-violence of dragon warfare. It's not necessarily all doom and gloom, though. I mean, there's no question that war and tragedy and trauma, injury, loss, all the kinds of things that happen in Ice and Fire, can and will shape a person and can even wipe the smile off of the face of someone like Theon Greyjoy or Jaime Lannister, both of whom are on the way in the books to becoming slightly more serious people 
after being humbled in, again, brutal Westerosi fashion. I, for one, don't see Aegon as another Joffrey, quote-unquote, and I do think we should entertain the possibility that his arc will have more complexity than simply a monstrous dragon king being let off the chain. Speaking of off the chain, did you guys know I'm old enough to have worn a wallet chain? <laughs> as was the style at the time, that's right. But these days, you don't need a chain to keep your wallet secure or just not lost. Hey Dave, is this your wallet? I was just hopping in the other room and it started beeping. I think you have a message from the bank. No, give me that. That's not how that works. This is an extra wallet and it comes with a tracking device. Solar powered, credit card size, and I can make it beep from my phone so I never lose my wallet. Oh wow, that, that's perfect for you. I can track its precise location or make it beep from my phone. And I can even make my phone ring from the extra wallet. So if I lose track of this, they really should make those for Valyrian steel swords. I mean, Blackfire hasn't been seen in ages. I'm pretty sure Illyrio and Fagon have it, but who? Don't worry about it. But check this out. Boom. Up to 12 cards at the touch of a button. And extra wallet uses RFID blocking to protect you from wireless skimming, data theft, and say it with me. Other sorts of digital mummery. Vegan Italian leather, space grade aluminum. I believe it's aluminium. Makes Extra Wallet the absolute number one no brainer holiday gift this year. I do love the ox blood red that you chose. I mean, it's a fantastic color if I do say so myself. They're already running at 50% off sale for the holidays, and you can get an extra 5% with our promo code, which is. Oh, is it Lightbringer? Indeed. Check out the link in the description below, or just use the promo code Lightbringer at checkout. And upgrade your wallet game or someone else's. Oh, and do check out all their other modern carry essentials. They got phone cases, key cases, camera bags, laptop bags, backpacks, and all sorts of other good stuff. Now back to Aegon the Unchained, who really could use a tracking device, actually. So early on in season one, and thanks for watching the whole ad, we saw King Viserys in front of the skull of Balerion the Black Dread, telling his daughter, Princess Rhaenyra, that the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. There is some level of control over the dragons. Obviously, they understand commands in High Valerian. That's pretty cool. Uh, but the relationship between the dragon and the dragon rider really is better understood as a partnership. As we know, a dragon is famously not a slave, but rather an intelligent and powerful creature. And a successful dragon-dragon rider relationship has to be developed through cooperative practice and training and experience as Damon and Caraxes have done. So it occurred to me that there's actually a little bit of a similar dynamic between the elder power brokers like Otto Hightower and some of the young dragon kings and princes and princesses that they hope to sort of ride the coattails of to political power. A dragon is not a slave and neither is an angsty teenage dragon rider. So there's that. We saw that exact realization flash across the faces of Otto and Alicent about, oh, I don't know, 0.5 seconds after they watch Aegon raise Blackfire, the ancestral Valerian steel sword of House Targaryen, before the thundering crowd. And there was much rejoicing. Hey, hey. What have we created? You can see them asking themselves. And the answer is a king, a supreme executive with a dragon and a war mandate. Now, Otto and Alicent might try to advise Aegon as he assumes stewardship over this giant mess that they helped create, but Aegon seems very much like the type to want to do things his way. I did it my way. Uh, to prove himself to zig when Otto tells him to zag. So we also know that the shadow of Otto Hightower is very, I don't know, suffocating. Is that the right word? Suffocating? Miasma-like? Yeah, so it is the kind of shadow that one wants to step out of. You can definitely sort of hear Aegon thinking to himself, why am I listening to this old guy with no dragon anyway? I, I'm, oh wait, I don't have to. I'm kind of kidding, but not really. I mean, we have seen that riding a dragon does instill one with a sense of confidence and independence, and how not? It really is a shame that we only got just a tiny little glimpse of Sunfire at a distance this poor, pixelated, blown-up image. Luckily, we have a lot of good Sunfire fan art to hold us over until we get to see Sunfire in the real in just a few months. But the point is, it's very important for us to think about King Aegon as a skilled, if inexperienced, dragon rider. Sunfire is, without a doubt, the second most formidable dragon that his side possesses. After Nana, of course, no one messes with Nana. 
No one messes with your Nana. And as such, he is a major asset to Team Green, purely in his capacity as a dragon rider. We can absolutely picture Otto clutching his pearl, I guess his chain of office it would be, and insisting that Aegon can't take his dragon into battle. No, your grace, it's just too dangerous. But like I said, that's not a realistic option in a Dragon Lord civil war. This is what playing the Game of Thrones means. It's, it's a sick thing. It, it means these high lords are marrying off their young teenage children in political alliances and... When we're talking about dragon lords, it means that they're sending their kids into war because, again, they're the only fighter pilots. And some of them are 13 years old, and that's just the breaks. Aegon is, like I said, about 21, and he can send himself into battle. He's the king, so. And I do think that he's the type to want to prove himself. Again, that yawning chasm of inadequacy. Uh, riding the dragon is, a, is something that he can do. He also seems like the type to perhaps maybe be a little overconfident in his abilities. I don't know, just a little. Or maybe we should just say confident in his abilities. After all, it does take a certain amount of moxie to fly a winged fire lizard into a medieval battle. Or to sit the Iron Throne and wear a crown for that matter. You definitely want your king to have a certain amount of swagger and authority, right? But... You want him to have earned it. That's how gravitas works. You can't fake it, really. Um, and Aegon simply hasn't had a chance to fly his dragon into battle yet, but that will change very soon. Now, obviously, I've read Fire and Blood, so I kind of know what happens, basically, but you don't really need to have read the book or to be a seer like Melisandre to understand that all the dragon lords will basically have no choice but to fly their dragons into battle. Although, shout out to Lenor Valerion, who did opt out of all this crazy shit and is now living his best life, presumably in Essos. So, sorry about that serving guy. Just don't, don't forget the serving guy, but yeah. In other words, the question of what will Aegon do in season two of House of the Dragon applies to two things. What will he do as king? What will he do for a Klondike bar? Uh, what will he do as king, and what will he do as one of the most lethal dragon riders? How long will Otto be able to keep him on the leash? Once Aegon takes to the skies, all bets are off for Otto or anyone else. You really cannot tell a dragon lord what to do, and you really can't tell what they will do once they're on the back of a dragon, especially when you've been calling them king. You guys like this better? No dark glasses? I'm not, I'm not the Corinthian. I, I do have eyeballs. Some of you guys are wondering. Anyways, so two other people loom large in Aegon's life, of course, besides Otto and Alicent. And that would be his sister wife, Helena, Targaryen things, uh, and his brother wife, Aemond. <laughs> I'm kidding. He would be brother husband, of course. Uh. <laughs> Moving right along, we'll take a minute to talk about each, beginning with Helena. Now, Aegon and Helena were never really close growing up, the way you want your brother and sister wedded pairs to be growing up. Anyway, they, they weren't really close, and that doesn't seem to have changed much now that they have kids, who are, by the way, Jaehaerys and Jahera, twins age six, and little Maelor, age two. And by the way, just to clarify, I just went and looked it up. Aegon is 22 and Helena is 20, which means they started having kids at 16 and 14 or so. Very young. And really, they just seem like a bad match of personalities, right? Helena is gifted with, or we might say troubled or burdened with, the gift of prophecy. And so she comes across very differently than most people. Ideally, she'd need a relationship partner that's very understanding or even appreciative of her gifts and her sort of different lived experience. And Aegon is very clearly not that person. This stands in kind of stark contrast to his brother Aemond, who's very serious and appreciative of Helena and probably would have made a better match if, again, if we're going on the principle that incest is fine or even necessary to keep the blood of the dragon pure. And Targaryen, hashtag Targaryen things. So Aegon, if we could crawl a little further inside of his head, put him on the couch, if you will, I would say that with his vices and abuse of power, he's essentially trying to shock himself into feeling something while simultaneously seeking to bury his inner turmoil and self-esteem issues. It kind of looks like Aegon is running from his responsibility, but that's really because facing up to the incredible duty and responsibility of being king 
Religious acts as a mirror to Aegon's own perceived inadequacy. He's overwhelmed and intimidated by it, at least at first, and it's probably the same with his relationship with Helena, where he probably feels inadequate as both father and husband. I mean, his own father, King Viserys, seems to have kind of neglected him a bit, so he doesn't really have a good example of being a good father. And he also doesn't seem to even begin to understand Helena or, you know, what she would need to be happy. And then instead of facing up to those challenges and giving himself the opportunity to grow, he seems to mostly run from those things and just consider them to be beneath him or kind of not his job. Now, the other factor here, of course, is Helena's Cassandra-like gift of prophecy. The show has chosen to play up this facet of her character and the story, which I think is very cool. And one of the big running questions is, who will listen to Helena, besides we in the audience, of course, who will parse out every little thing that she says. Uh, We're still trying to figure out how many things can be the beast beneath the boards. Lots of things is the answer. The bellies, blood and cheese. Anyway, King Aegon really should be right at the top of the list of people who should listen to Helena. I mean, even if Aegon kind of doesn't really understand Helena in general, and even if Helena's prophecies are difficult to parse in particular, again... (laughs) Everything is the beast beneath the boards. Aegon really should know enough to treat her warnings as credible. He should know that Targaryens have dragon dreams and that she's not just mumbling stuff about the future. That's, that, that's, that's prophecy for sure. So I guess what I'm getting at is, could there be some sort of moment where Aegon is the one to listen to Helena and this sort of maybe brings them together, at least for a little bit? Fire and Blood doesn't really tell us much about these sorts of dialogue details. So we really are all just speculating as to how the show is going to play the relationship dynamic between any given set of characters. And I'm wondering if, you know, Aegon either listening or not listening to Helena will be an interesting plot point in their relationship. And that brings us to Aemond. Aemond One-Eye. Aemond... Kinslayer. That's what he's called now that he's killed his nephew, Luke. So yeah, we, we've already seen that Aemond has kind of a mix of emotions towards Aegon. There's definitely some judgment and condemnation of Aegon's lack of seriousness and other shortcomings. But on the other hand, Aemond is very loyal to his family and he takes the political game very seriously. And of course, the political game is now war, which he'll take even more seriously. We've seen that Aemond doesn't hesitate to confront his brother Aegon about his his failings, but he does that while dragging him back to do his duty, right? So ultimately, Aemond is riding for Team Green pretty friggin' hard. In other words, Aemond, along with Helena, might be one of the only people that Aegon will actually listen to out of respect, appreciation, and admiration, which is not necessarily something we could say about Aegon's relationship to Otto or even Alicent. That's something that we'll be looking to see. But there has, I mean, that is that has looked a little rough at times. So if Aegon has any inclination to, you know, try to be a good king or war leader or any of that, um, we have to assume that Aemon will be right there to try to help him. Now, one very interesting, one of the biggest hanging questions from season one is how King Aegon will react to news of the chomp, of Aemon's decision to remove Lucerys from the chessboard and begin the Dance of Dragons in earnest. Now, I've said since the episode aired that in general, I think Aemon will come home and claim to have meant to kill Luke, as opposed to admitting that he lost control of his dragon. Simply because I think Aemon's calculus will be that it's better to project strength with a little bit of cruelty and aggression than it is to, again, admit things like weakness, inexperience, lack of planning, that sort of thing. I do wonder, however, if perhaps Aemond might confide to someone, like Aegon, that he did lose control of Vagar, and that the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. I mean, perhaps we'll see them have that conversation in front of the skull of Beleriand the Black Dread in an echo of Viserys and Rhaenyra, talking about the same sort of thing. That would be very poetic. I hope they did that. If they, <laughs> That seems like a pretty good idea. Now, we'll actually be looking to gauge the reactions of three different people to the news of the chomp. Uh, King Aegon, as well as Otto and Alicent. Oh yes, and the common people. Hashtag Team Small Folk. Their reaction may be the most important of all, but 
As for King Aegon, his reaction to Aemon's move will tell us a lot about how he's going to initially conduct the war, you know, with a lot of aggression or with a little more caution. <laughs> Probably aggression, who are we kidding? Beyond that, I'll simply highlight the fact that King Aegon and Prince Aemond are pretty much the entire dragon muscle behind the Team Green War effort. Helena does have the dragon Dreamfire, but it's kind of hard to picture her flying her dragon into battle and burning people alive. I mean, we saw her reaction to the sudden violence of Daemon decapitating Vaemond Valerion in the throne room. She covered her ears as if she were hearing some horrific sound that no one else heard and we know that she's psychic so perhaps she's perceiving all the horror that will come because of this action it's hard to say exactly but it's it's some sort of cauldron of overstimulation and it's definitely an indication that helena might not be the type to be cut out to take her dragon into battle it's just hard to picture her operating in the sort of hellscape that we see daemon and caraxes thriving in and <laughs> helping to create. So that pretty much leaves Aemond and Aegon and their dragons Vagar and Sunfire. There's also young Daron, who is confirmed, confirmed to be a part of the show. He's down in Old Town, and he's currently the squire for Lord Ormond Hightower. He has a dragon to Sarion, the Cobalt Queen, but she's kind of smallish, and they do have an important role to play in the story, but... You know, Tessarion is a good bit smaller than Sunfire, and a lot smaller than Nana Vagar, of course. And that's it as far as dragons for Team Green are concerned. Thus, you can see that Aegon and Sunfire really will have to take the field, and they'll probably have to do so repeatedly if they want to win this war. It's pretty much going to be up to Aegon and Aemond with their dragons Sunfire and Vagar to match up to Daemon and Caraxes and Rhaenys, and Melis, and Rhaenyra, and Cyrax, and Jaceres, and Vermax. And Daemon is even talking about trying to find people to ride the wild dragons on Dragonstone. We saw that last season. So yeah, it's pretty much going to be a team green, bro-bro dragon adventure for the win. Well, well, maybe. I mean, Daemon and Caraxes and company will have something to say about that too. So... Yeah, I hope you guys are as excited about season two of House of the Dragon as I am. I mean, I really thought that Danny's attack on the Lannister baggage train accompanying the Dothraki army back in season seven of A Game of Thrones was really freaking cool and well done. So definitely looking forward to the Dragon Wars to come, if you will. And I'm assuming you guys are too. And if you want to ride the ride with us here at House of Flying D's, ride the snake, then, you know, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and Come join us for Starry Wisdom Sunday at 3 p.m. Pacific. And then, of course, during the show season, we'll be moving that back to right after the show, where we'll hope to continue our run as the second most popular House of the Dragon postgame show. All due respect and credit and appreciation to Alt Shift X. We know you have choices out there. We appreciate your support. And I have been David Lightbringer, and I'll see you again very soon with more House of the Dragon videos.